Battle Block Theater is a game about creativity and ingenuity. Absolutely nothing in this game can't get done if you just think through situations and use the many tools at your disposal. So today, I'll be challenging myself to utilize these mechanics to their full potential by playing through this entire game without ever jump, uh, without, without jumping. Okay, maybe not in this part. Okay, uh, so you can do about half of this part jumpless, which is... I mean, that's pretty cool, I guess. Jeez, they, like, really expect you to jump in this game, huh? All right, hold on. Give me a sec. Ooh. Huh. Hey. Oh, hey. Uh, have you ever heard of Battle Block Theater? Um, I've never heard of that game. Oh, oh, um, well, I mean, I was just gonna ask if you could help with a jump list challenge. Uh, I mean, I could buy it. Oh, oh wait, really? Oh, oh, well, in that case, uh... Battle Block Theater is a game about teamwork and cooperation. Absolutely nothing in this game can get done unless you bring along a friend. Trust me, I try. So today, I'll be joined by barely better at video games than me, Alec, to help me answer the question. Is it possible to beat Battle Block Theater without jumping? We start off in the prologue slash tutorial, which, much like every other no jumping challenge, immediately forces us to figure out how to kinda sorta jump. But luckily, since there's two of us, this actually isn't too hard, cause there are a ton of movement and attacking options in this game whose intended purpose is to screw your teammate over that we'll be using to our advantage. In order of least to most useful, there's these guys, who don't do jack, the uppercut, which does give direct height, but only in a specific, mostly unhelpful arc, the bop, which gives great vertical height, but only if we can find a way to stand on each other, the kick, which is a great way to stand on each other, and sends a the perfect low angle to clear many gaps, the throw, which is just a further kick, and of course, dying. Alright, I guess I'll explain that one. See, most of the very useful options that I just mentioned require Alec and I to be right next to each other, which is rarely going to be the case, especially if we, you know, ever use one. Dying, however, is always an option, and since we're playing co-op, players don't ever respawn at actual checkpoints, and instead usually spawn right next to the other player. Usually. This makes our primary strategy throughout most levels consist of one person suplexing the other past an obstacle, dying, respawning next to them, and repeating. And this respawn strategy is really all we needed to make it past the prologue. However, things won't be quite as easy as we move on to the first real chapter. Now, it's at this point in the video where you may notice some weird structural things going on, and that's because Alec and I are actually both making videos on this challenge, with each of us tackling different levels and showcasing different tricks. I'll still be going over all the levels and finales linearly, but you kind of have to watch both videos if you want the full experience of what this challenge has to offer. So yeah, that all being said, we're starting off with level 2. This place gives us our first taste of exactly what I was mentioning before. A section with slightly less simple level design that our basic little movement options aren't going to be able to deal with on their own. Based on what I've told you so far, you might think that this is actually a major problem. For if our suplex moves don't work, then there doesn't really seem to be much we can do. And we have even less options if we're on our own or even just slightly apart from one another. We were going to need something beyond the bare basics. Something to give just a little bit of an extra boost. And that's where Gamer Subs comes in, baby! I'm actually so happy to be partnered with these guys, I unironically really, really like their drinks, and look, they even materialized me from the Plants vs. Zombies video as a sticker, and you can get it for literally zero dollars by trying out one of the flavors for free. Of course, you got the classic red raspberry, solid stuff, right up there alongside a Guacamole Gamer Fart 9000, it's another pretty standard one. There's also, uh, this one. This is another one of the ones that there is. If you click the link in the description, you can get a completely free sample, no card information required, and if you're one of the first 500 people to do it, you can also get another free sample, which is not only hilarious, but it's also a pretty good deal, I think. That's cool, but, uh, how is that gonna help with this level? Uh, I don't know, it's pretty cool though. In order to actually get past these more complex obstacles, we're gonna have to instead pull from the most important mechanics in this entire game, the weapons. The weapons in this game are usually obtained by collecting yarn balls within the levels, which can then be traded in the hub for one random weapon at a time. However, we can actually get around this by instead just playing the game and collecting all the weapons normally, at which point resetting the game file will delete level data, but maintain all of your weapons right at the start. I say this as if it's an intentional thing that I did, but it's actually just because the weapons are saved in your Steam inventory, and I have no clue if there's a way to get rid of them. But that's alright, because this means that we get immediate access to some of the most interesting and powerful options that this game has to offer, including what is arguably the most useful for this challenge, the Force Blast. First up, we got Force Blast. Where are we, where are we dropping? Um, it's pretty good, which is better than pretty alright. I mean, anytime when we're in doubt, 
It's Force Ball. The Force Blast is insane, and both of us had it practically permanently equipped throughout the entire challenge. It's a projectile that travels in an upward arc and explodes after either a couple seconds pass or when it collides with certain objects, which includes players, and its explosion is potent. Depending on the angle at which you get hit, this thing can just send you flying. This is obviously quite useful when we're together, but it's also useful in situations like this, where we are just slightly separated. But it's also, also a fantastic source of direct height if we can blast against a wall even when we're on our own. With just one one weapon, we've not only given ourselves a new source of insane height, but we've also seemingly solved all of the problems that were introduced at the beginning of this level, allowing us to breeze past it without any other issues. But it doesn't stop there, because blasting off of walls and each other, alongside our regular suplexes and respawn abuse, almost single-handedly carried us through the next couple of levels. And in fact, most of the levels in general, which shouldn't be too surprising given what you've already seen what we're capable of. Because of this, I won't be going too too in-depth on the majority of the areas in this game, as it's fairly self-explanatory how we can get past obstacles that look like this, or this, or this, or this. However, not every section in this game is trivialized by our current threats, trust me. And this sentiment is best supported once we move on to the next level, which introduces what may be the single worst mechanic in this entire challenge, boats. These things float on water, and we don't. This means that the game often expects us to use boats to travel across some water, which, you know, makes sense. Hey, what does this have to do with jumping? Well, as it turns out, my previous challenge sins are coming back to haunt me. For although getting in boats and using them is perfectly fine, getting out of boats requires either jumping, which is banned, or dying, which isn't incredibly productive in this case. This makes boats effectively useless. Actually, worse than useless, they're literally death traps. And sections that utilize them may as well look like this. Big ol' stretches of water that wouldn't be possible to cross even if we could jump. So so what's our answer then? Well, there's no single catch-all solution to boat sections, so instead we'll have to get a bit creative and use some of our other tools to solve every boat section individually. In this particular situation, for example, although we can blast at least one guy up and over this overhang, we still need something to help cross this gap without the boat. And that something came in the form of this little dude. Let's rank Frog. Alright, you convinced me it's time. <laughs> it's time for Frog. I'd probably put it in O on Reliable. That's probably what I'm thinking as well. Definitely above uh, C tier. Oh yeah, he's alright. He's a little guy. He's got a hat yeah, and a I... cane, which is cool. Oh, I like the bow tie too, yeah. I mean, he'd be cooler with like a regular tie, but bow ties are alright. Mm, that's not true, but okay. <sighs> Frogs are definitely an interesting tool to have. Their unstoppable walk can traverse hazards, walls, and ceilings, and they can act as temporary platforms for us to stand on. Really, really temporary platforms. Unfortunately, these guys explode as soon as you get near them, so they're not the complete boat solver that we may have been hoping for. They are, however, just good enough to help cross this first boat section, and with a bit more blasting, complete our first boat level. And hey, that wasn't too bad at all. Maybe the things really won't be too big of an issue. Oh. Okay, no, that was a baby zone. This is what real boat sections look like. Gat dang oceans. And they require a little bit more than just a frog to clear. But before we even try tackling this behemoth, let's first take a look at an earlier section of this level, which, although again very simple, introduced what is arguably the most powerful tool in our arsenal, fire. What are, oh, what are, you, what are you thinking of putting fire? Uh, well, you know, um, let me just, uh, you know, making an executive <laughs> decision. <laughs> oh my gosh, I don't even see it move on my screen, it just yeah, teleports. <laughs> Dude, fire's OP. Alright, <laughs> you can just do everything. The fireball allows us to, get this, set each other on fire. And although this really doesn't seem conducive to the whole, you know, beating the game thing, take a look at what happens when you land on water while on fire. Oh yeah, you can probably see how this helps with the boats. Except actually, you're probably seeing a little too much. Although fire is definitely a huge addition to our roster of weapons, and it destroys a bunch of sections when used in combination with kicks and throws, it doesn't just do everything for us. First off, touching water extinguishes you immediately, so in most cases you can only ever get one extra bounce, which isn't always enough. And secondly, ceilings. In order to prevent players from just jumping over bodies of water, the developers often implemented overhangs and low ceilings in these sections in an attempt to make them impossible to cross without using the boat. These two weaknesses come together to make many boat sections, including this one, remain as absolute headaches that neither frogs nor fire are able to solve on their own. But who's to say that we can't combine them? First, we use a fire kick to get one person onto these rails, which can then be used to fall onto this platform up here and set a checkpoint with some higher ground. From there, I go ahead and set Alec on fire while he tosses a frog into the water. Then, by dropping down and walking on the frog, he can get a little bit of extra distance while keeping the flame alive. Then, he receives some knockback from the frog's explosion, giving some horizontal momentum that is then conserved by bouncing off the water with the fire, granting just enough distance to swerve these overhangs and make it onto the platform. Oh, and me? 
You actually don't worry about what I was doing. This little trick allowed us to bypass yet another level, leading us straight on into an even worse boat section. This area, in contrast to the last one, has no usable high ground, and this low ceiling makes throws virtually useless. This means that our frog-fire combination isn't gonna work here, so we gotta continue to dig through our deep pockets of weapons and see if we can find some more useful ones. And although we solved our last issue by combining two very useful weapons, we might also be able to benefit from combining two less useful weapons. So we got we got these these two goobers. Fan, it, fan honestly might just exist. I think so too. <laughs> yeah, <it's, laughs> I think it exists. Vacuum, on the other hand, vacuum's like okay. Because I know we can like pull another player up a platform, but aside right. from that and like the really cool trick <laughs> that, that um, you're not allowed to else? talk about, yeah. there's actually no cool trick involving the vacuum. You know, yeah, you're right. Know. You're not fine. It's CT. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would put it in C. I'm not gonna say the joke but I will write it down. Needless to say, these weapons ain't great. The vacuum is okay, I guess. It allows us to traverse one block staircases without any deaths in the workplace, but since we need to be near each other for either of these things to do anything, they're generally no better than any of our normal options. But what would happen if we combined them? After all, both of them are capable of giving the other guy height depending on positioning, so if we position ourselves in just the right way, we might be able to make some magic happen. Oh, like that! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Respond? Yes! <laughs> this is the flying machine. One of the most powerful techniques that we have in our disposal, as you may have been able to figure. The way it works is by first stacking ourselves on top of each other and then moving into this position. The guy on the bottom equips the fan and faces to the right, and the guy on top equips the vacuum and faces to the left. Then, if both of us use the weapons at the same time and start moving in the opposite direction, we'll start taking flight. The reason this works is actually pretty simple if you think about it. When the bottom guy uses the fan, it blows the top guy up and away, creating some distance, which then gives top guy's vacuum enough room to suck bottom guy up and in. And maintaining this magical formation as we go airborne allows us to continuously gain height over time. Now the flying machine is obviously pretty dang good, but it does have a few weaknesses. Firstly, the fan and vacuum are limited in how long they can be used, so we can only fly for about a second before breaking apart. Secondly, our flight trajectory is always a fixed diagonal one, so ceilings, overhangs, and weird level geometry continue to be our arch nemeses. And thirdly, this thing takes a lot of teamwork. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Alright, <laughs> here we are. The ideal height gaining formation is actually really fragile, so if either of our positions or timings are off by even a little bit, then it either won't do anything, or it'll work at first and then break halfway through. Regardless of its downsides, however, the flying machine, alongside some more throwing and blasting, gives us just enough juice to finally complete all of Chapter 1's normal levels, which means that we got a finale to do. Unlike the majority of levels in this game, which give us plenty of time to analyze situations and grind out tedious or precise strategies, finales give us this, an extremely tight timer that just barely gives us enough wiggle room to beat the level even with jumping, let alone with our slow jumpless movement options. This means that we had to optimize our routes like crazy, and either one of us making a mistake could be completely detrimental. Luckily though, this first finale doesn't require anything too crazy, and instead just serves as a bit of a final exam for some of the simpler techniques that, at this point, have become second nature to both of us. So after a bit of maneuvering and an ending that wasn't stressful <laughs> even in the slightest, we were finally able to complete our very first chapter, and move on with a couple more tricks up our sleeves. The first level of Chapter 2 starts off pretty smooth, but that's only up until we reach this section, which introduces the propeller power-up. These things, alongside jetpacks and wings, are all excellent sources of easy and direct height is what I would say if we were allowed to use them! As it turns out, using any of these things requires the use of the jump button, which means all of them are banned. This not only means that we don't have access to some potentially powerful options, but it also means that sections that usually require them are extra bad, as the game expects us to fly when we can't even jump. Blasts and throws don't quite make it which means we gotta pull out yet another one of our seemingly infinite supply of useful weapons, the Poison Bubble. Next, we've got Poison Bubble, the last of the, uh, cool weapons. <laughs> I feel it's, like it's pretty alright. I'm saying right? it's pretty alright. Like, the Poison yeah. Bubble actually bounces you, which I think is such an underrated thing. Yeah, that that's actually huge. It does actually, like, just reset your momentum. Mm -hmm. So you can just, ch like, change your jump mid-jump, or mid-not-jump, sorry. Mid-what? <laughs> 
<laughs> the bubble is a projectile that acts similarly to the force ball, but rather than blast us up with insane height, it just bops us up with a little bit of height. Now, although that does sound like a strict downgrade, it's actually still pretty good for us. And the reason is because it actually takes one of your jumps away when you land on it. Alright, now I'm saying it, it doesn't really make sense why that's useful. You might be confused as to how taking away jumps is good in any context, especially one where we can't jump at all, but it's actually because of this move, the aerial stall. This thing is one of our moves that just isn't very good. It doesn't grant any height, spikes the other player downwards if you hit them, and although it does stall vertical momentum, which is occasionally useful, it also stalls horizontal momentum, so it can't really be used to grant any extra distance in the air, unless you only have one jump. The aerial stall slows you down if you have both of your jumps and if you have none of your jumps, but for some inexplicable reason, it lets you keep all of your speed if you only have one of your jumps, allowing you to glide through the air with an insane amount of extra distance. So by landing on a bubble with a blast, I was not only able to get a little bit of extra height, but I was also able to use the aerial stall to get the necessary distance to make it past this first flying section. Oh, with the second flying section? Yeah, we just flew through this one. Forgot that was an option, I'm not gonna lie. This next level is pretty simple, just some standard blasts is all. Well, that is except for this one, I guess. This is an ice blast. For whatever reason, standing on ice while getting blasted completely changes your speed and trajectory to an insane degree. In most cases, this actually isn't too great for us, as speed rarely matters in this challenge, and traveling vertically is generally more important than traveling at an extraordinarily fast diagonal direction. However, this wasn't the case after we completed this level and came across this section. We can't really do much here. The fact that these are destructible blocks makes landing on them basically pointless for us, which means that we had to tackle this section as if these blocks were weren't even here, so you know what that means. Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> From there, I would say the rest of this level was easy, but there was actually a bit of an interesting section right after this. Our classic strat involving respawn abuse appeared not to work here at first, for it seems we can only teleport to the other player if there's enough space on the ground, which isn't the case here. But we can actually get around this by having one guy blast himself as the other guy is respawning in order to trick the game into thinking there's enough space, allowing us to move past this part easy peasy. But things weren't going to be so smooth forever, because this next level has another boat section. Alright, let's look at the situation. Although this over hang looks pretty terrible for us, it's actually not the worst thing in the world, as we can throw a projectile at these destructible blocks to temporarily get them out of our way, making it a bit easier. That being said though, this overhang? Yeah, it's still pretty bad. It's too low for a flying machine to work, which means we're gonna instead have to implement fire in some capacity. Fire on its own though doesn't quite cut it, and pairing it with a frog is gonna suck, since we'd have to simultaneously time destroying the blocks and positioning a frog in the right spot, which is just not very feasible. We're gonna need something new, which means pulling out yet another insane weapon, the paper airplane. Paper for airplane. This this get this guy. This is my guy. This is my He's guy. He's got it. Yeah, I was going <laughs> to say you can't put him anywhere. <laughs> this is my dude. He's so cool. He's just too powerful. He's the most powerful platform in the game. He's pretty strong and like already like the frog was pretty powerful. Imagine the frog holding the paper airplane and you should be afraid. That's my nightmares. Easily pretty all right. <laughs> easily. The paper airplane is easily one of the most unique tools that we have in our arsenal. It's an exploding projectile, which on its own can occasionally provide some knockback to give us height or redirect momentum, as in the case of my patented ultimate technique, which is the only way for one person to get past a single block. But its real utility comes before it explodes, as it actually acts as an object that we can interact with in a variety of ways, which includes the fact that we can stand on it. This means that moving the boat in a certain position and landing a paper airplane on top of it can actually create a makeshift platform for us that, unlike frogs, doesn't move and doesn't explode. However, there are a couple weaknesses with this. For one, I kinda lied. This platform actually does explode if the player who threw it dies, uses another weapon, or sits around for too long. This can all be circumvented by using a glitch called the permanent paper airplane, but this trick requires pausing during the throwing animation, which is impossible when you're playing online multiplayer. So this little platform that we've created for ourselves is actually quite fragile, but that didn't stop us from being able to set it up, reposition, destroy the overhang, and make it happen. <gasps> Please! Oh! Yes! Oh my gosh! <laughs> Yeah, that was it for that level. This next level had some pretty interesting sections. There was this area, in which Alec decided to use my drowning body as a temporary flotation device, very cool, very fun, and this place. Although it looks like there should be enough space for someone to respawn in this little cubby, these temporary bridge blocks aren't considered safe by the game, and therefore don't seem to count as respawn areas. This meant that we had to get a little creative with our blasts in order to redirect Alec's momentum to where we needed to go. And then, after all that, we just get another god dang boat section, come on man. This time, everything is worse. The overhang is even lower and these destructible blocks are way harder to actually get to. Yet again, all of our previous strats that we've used on the prior bow sections just aren't gonna work here, which means that we're gonna have to pull out some more new stuff. Oh wait. Easily the most trash weapon, I think? Oh no. Buttons on fans, which comes up. 
once. No, no. Grenade. We occasionally used to like kill cats. No, no, no. We ran out of good weapons. Say goodbye to the days of just pulling out new solutions out of a hat, because now is when the challenge truly begins. And it starts with cracking this bow section with only the tools we already have. Now, despite how it looks, it actually isn't too bad and bears a striking resemblance to the very first boat section we came across, and our solution was pretty similar as well. Rather than trying to make it under this overhang, we were instead able to wait for these completely random shifting blocks to move into the perfect position to allow us to blast up and stack on top of each other. We were then able to use some bops to sneak our way into this top area, and from there, all it took was a simple fire maneuver to finish off the level. After that fiasco, we had a nice and easy level that involved some fairly basic strats that I don't think I need to elaborate on before we made it to our second finale, which starts off brutal. This area usually expects us to move this block onto these spikes, which we can then use to jump up here. The issue is that we actually can't jump, crazy I know, which means that we're gonna have to find another solution. And since there doesn't seem to be a way to get both of us onto this block after moving it, we decided to forego using the block entirely and instead use a paper airplane. Not only can the airplane again act as a makeshift platform that allowed me to stand on these spikes, but it's also significantly smaller than the block is. This reduced size allows me to use this block to my right as a wall that I can blast off of, allowing us to continue on. And no joke, the first attempt where we got this airplane trick to work ended up being the winning attempt, as we've gotten very natural at maneuvering through levels jumpless via blasting and occasional teamwork, finishing off the second chapter and propelling us forward with some solid momentum. Chapter 3 starts off fairly rough, as this very first level has a wing section, which is just terrible for this challenge. Or at least it would be if we didn't just do this. As it turns out, levels in this game only require you to collect three of the gems throughout it in order to unlock the exit. This usually doesn't matter at all, as the exit is typically at the end of the level anyway, at which point we would almost always incidentally have plenty of gems. But as we get further in the game, the devs tried to get a little bit cuter with the level design, putting the exit in the middle or even the beginning of the levels, which opens the door to cheese if we can find a way to get three gems early. This next level wasn't quite as cheesable, but it still involves some pretty nifty strats. This area, for example, again didn't allow us to respawn on these fan blocks, which meant that Alec had to move around and press all these buttons to turn the fans off, and then I had to throw a force ball underneath where he was standing so he could get blasted through the platform. Then, after an area that required some flame, we came across this section, which didn't look too pretty. But we were again able to use a paper airplane as a platform on these spikes in order to get a better position for a throw, which could get us out of there. And continuing with this momentum, this next level implemented a ton more more wing sections, but these really weren't too bad at all. We were able to bypass this first one with a simple fire throw, and the second with some good old-fashioned teamwork. So it's three, two, one. Oh, 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 oh. Yeah, oh, go! Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> we were making fantastic progress, but you can probably guess what stopped that progress immediately. <clears throat> Luckily, this one actually isn't that bad at all. There's just a simple overhang that we probably could have bypassed using fire and either a frog or an airplane, but instead we went with an even easier option that involved this movable block. Now at first, this thing seems useless. Grabbing onto these things turns your character into a two block wide entity that I like to call the holding entity, which means that we can't fit through these one block gaps and move this block anywhere helpful, even if we could jump. But we had a little bit of a trick up our sleeve. This is a really weird trick that I don't have a name for and also don't know how it works, but I do know how to do it. It's super simple. If you're holding onto a block and then die specifically by explosion, then it forcefully moves the block up, even if it's not supposed to fit. This allowed us to move the block outside of its containment chamber and under the overhang, giving us a much more sturdy platform that we can use to fire off of. Oh yeah, also this happened. Uh, you can't get up there, but uh, I'm gonna convince you that you can for a crazy trick that I'm about to do. Okay. So uh, go ahead, try it. Try and force ball up okay. there. You idiot, you absolute buffoon. <laughs> <laughs> but all was not what it seemed, as this very next level introduced what is easily the worst boat section that we've seen thus far. Oh no, yeah, that's all right. Just combine all of the worst aspects of every boat section we've seen up to this point seems fair enough to me. Flying machine? Yeah, it won't work. Fire? Absolutely won't work. Setting up any sort of platform down here isn't even gonna get close to working. And much like that one time, there isn't some secret hidden boss of a weapon that we haven't used yet that's just gonna come in and save us. Instead, we need to be a little resourceful with what we've already got to skip the boat section entirely. Entirely. It starts by busting this block at the beginning of the level out of its cage with an explosion, and then using these fans and some creative platforming to get the block all the way over here. From there, we have to get this block inside of this area with the other block, which is a little more complicated than you may expect, as you usually can't move blocks through clouds. You know, 
usually. As it turns out, if you grab a block while standing halfway in a cloud, it'll move the block past the cloud's collision, allowing you to drag it right through. Now that we have all the blocks in the right positions, Alec moves on top of the left block while I grab the one on the right. He then uses the fan to push me to the right. Now, this shouldn't do anything for trying to move me to the right while just push the block I'm holding against this wall, so the collision will prevent me from going anywhere. But I can get around this by holding left. This tricks the game into thinking I'm moving left, even though the fan is actually still pushing me to the right. So for just to check the collision on the block like an idiot, <laughs> it allows me to push it through the wall. From there, I move back to the left a teensy bit in order to stand on this button and activate this bridge, so that Alec can drop down and start pushing the left block into me by repeatedly grabbing it and letting it go. Like I've kinda already touched upon, grabbing and releasing a block changes the state of both the player and the block, and combines them into one holding entity. As far as positions go, players and the holding entity can occupy pretty much any position on a continuous scale. Blocks, on the other hand, can only occupy specific discrete positions on the block grid. You can't just place a block halfway between two others, for example. So when transitioning between these two states, the game has to make some compromises regarding the block's position. This is why, for example, pulling blocks through clouds works. When you press the grab button, the game looks for the nearest block in a certain range in front of the player, and moves it to the player's current position when performing the state transition. Similarly, when releasing a block, the game looks for the nearest discrete block position and moves the block there, while keeping the player's position the same. So then, using this information, we can determine what will happen if you repeatedly grab and release a block while pushing it into another holding entity. Just running up against the block will halt the player's position right at the wall, but grabbing the block and transitioning into a holding entity would allow you to move slightly to the right. Upon releasing it, the block will return to its original position, but the player will maintain his slightly changed position inside of the block. Grabbing again at this point will then move the block into this slightly shifted position, which at this point may even be beyond the bit of collision that stopped the holding entity from moving to the right last time, allowing you to move even more to the right. Repeating this process allowed Alec to slowly push the block beyond my holding entity's collision until it was far enough to the right such that the nearest block placement was right on top of me. And from there, all I had to do was release my block. The game looks for an available space to put the block, but but since Alec just occupied the last one that was free, it has no clue where to put it, which makes something magical happen. Wait, wait, that's it! That's it! That's it! Oh, we did it! We did it! Block deleted! <laughs> block deletion! This is, uh, oh uh, yeah, he just said it, it's block deletion. The game gets so confused at the insane position that we put ourselves in that it has no choice than to put a block on top of another block, which results in the wall just getting deleted. By utilizing this trick, we can dig our way through the level in order to completely avoid the boat section in its entirety, allowing us to finish off this level, and yeah, no, actually, there's another insane section after that. For this tiny boat area, we went ahead and pulled another block out of captivity in order to set up a platform that both of us could use to land on these lava blocks. From there, we had to find a way to get up here, which is incredibly difficult given that there are no permanent platforms that we could stand on here, or at least that's what it looks like. <laughs> yeah, so as it turns out, you actually can stand on spike blocks so long as you stand at the very edge. And and in fact, there are actually a lot of different types of blocks that you can stand on the edge of in order to avoid interacting with them. In this case, it allows us to both make our way up to either side of this spike platform through the use of a ton of super precise force blasts and bubbles. From there, after a slick boomerang shot, I was able to set Alec ablaze, and we used the fact that fire makes you briefly immune to spikes in order for him to set me on fire and kick me to victory. And with that absolutely insane level out of the way, we have yet another finale to mow through. Except this one stinks. The first half of the level isn't anything too special, just some basic movement that we had to optimize to a T in order to reserve as much time as possible for the final two areas. The first is a wing section, which includes an insanely long stretch of water with close to nothing to stand on. In order to make it past here, we had to first use this lava block in combination with an aerial stall in order to make it on either side of this laser block. From there, we had to time an incredibly precise combination of weapon usages. I would shoot out a bubble as Alex set me on fire. I'd then use the fire to bounce off of the water onto the bubble, which gives just barely enough height and distance to make it to this cannon platform and to another checkpoint. And that was the easy part. Because although we were able to make it to this checkpoint, it would be the last checkpoint in the entire level. As it turns out, even though this looks like one of the simplest obstacles we've come across, the game considers none of the ground on this side of the wall safe, which therefore prevents us from using respawn abuse. This means that we need some way for both of us to get up and over this set of blocks at the same time in order for us to be together for the final throw. And there's only one way we knew of that could make it work. Three, two, one, go. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Uh, 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 so we just go and you throw me. We just go and you throw me. No! <laughs> no! Three, two, one, go. Okay, okay, uh, go, okay. go, 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 go. Yes! Oh my gosh! Oh my god, what a love.
Chapter 4 starts off comparably very tame, with the return of blasts, flames, and respawns being all we needed to complete this level without too much effort. Of course, the second level gave us a little bit more trouble, with an ice blast, fire throw, and flying machine being required to make it past some extra scary bits. Conveyors are introduced in this chapter, which are actually really bad in a jumpless challenge as we don't move fast enough to counteract their movement, which makes them basically just glorified gaps. And this is best seen in this next level, which requires us to bring two of these rocks across multiple conveyor platforms. The first rock is easy, it just required a bit of teamwork to juggle this rock to the very end. After doing that though, we had to find a way to make it back to the beginning of this section to do the same for the second rock. This lower platform was pretty easy to vault, but this last one's low ceiling made things pretty complicated. However, we eventually figured out that, much like bubbles, throws actually take away one of your jumps, meaning that we could both make it on top of the conveyor, throw a person, and then have that person do an aerial stall with full momentum in order to make it all the way across and grab the second rock we needed. This level also introduces pigs, which are actually quite scary, or at least they were at first. Initially, they seemed just like worse boats, as we need to use them in order to cross floors of spikes and bodies of water, but there's no way to dismount them without jumping. And heck, you can't even blow yourself up to dismount them like you can with boats. What you can do, however, is dismount them using knockback from the other player. This means that pigs are actually way better than boats, as we can not only actually use them when it's intended, but we can also reap the benefits of their automatic jump, which is perfectly legal in this challenge, as it doesn't use the jump button. So this next level involved us just fumbling around for 20 minutes trying to figure out a way to destroy these destructible blocks, because that's just something we both randomly decided was a necessary thing for us to complete the level. Uh, it wasn't, but more importantly, we had this section to deal with, which required some out-of-the-box thinking. In order to continue in the level, we needed to press this button to make these blocks disappear. But in order for someone to press this button, we needed these blocks to be gone, which required someone to be pressing this button. The issue with this is that accessing either button required both of us, which isn't something we can do if one person's occupied with pressing a button. However, we noticed that while experimenting with other solutions, we would occasionally respawn up to the top button. So a potential solution could be for one of us to throw the other to the button on the left and then die in in order to respawn at the top, but this didn't seem to work as we expected. Because you need to blast me uh, up here first. Oh. oh. Why? Sometimes it just does Why? that. Why? Okay, we can use this to our advantage. If I don't land on the white blocks and I just land on the conveyor belt, I think I'll respawn up here. Okay, you want to try that? I'm going to fall down and try to. And then you just walk in when you're ready, and then hopefully I respawn up there. What the? <sighs> you want to try it again? Why did I spawn up there the first time? Uh, uh, what? Why? Okay, what? try it. Try it the other way. You fall down, and I'll just run. Okay. And then see if this works. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Why? Why? Why does it spawn you up there? It's gonna spawn you up there. Yeah. If you if die, die it's it want it wants you up there so bad. Oh no. It okay, doesn't. now I'm. And now I you're. I don't get it. Uh, you wanna try it again? <laughs> Maybe we flip flop it this time. So do you want? Okay, I'll throw you and then fall in the water. Okay. Okay. That's so dumb. <laughs> it take oh wait. <laughs> Get to take that block it out of here. As it turns out, the respawns in this game were a little funkier than we previously thought, and although they could absolutely work to our detriment, the weird way they function could also be abused to our advantage. Anyway, this level ended with 15 minutes of literally random teleporting nonsense, so uh, that's pretty cool. After that complete disaster level, alongside a relatively uneventful final level, we already had the fourth finale on our hands, and this one also stinks. After setting each other on fire to navigate through the first couple of blocks here, we come face to face with some god dang hoopla. The layout here seems specifically designed to mess with us, as we need to somehow somehow conjure up two separate instances of height gaining while under the time constraint of both the conveyors and this laser. Lasers, by the way, completely random. They can just decide to shoot faster or slower than normal. Just something I thought I'd bring up. Anyway, the way we got past this part involved me doing all of the work and Alex standing completely still. Or more accurately, he would set me on fire, switch to the force blast as I made my way up a layer, and then time the blast such that it hits me through the platform and into the teleporter. Okay, but like for this next part, I actually did do all of the work, which allowed this to happen. Oh yeah, and this is the winning attempt. For sure. Oh yeah, for sure. <laughs> we got so much time. What are you talking about? Yeah, I've got time. Oh, I'm up. I'm up. Oh, you're up. Okay. Oh yeah, we actually. Uh, oh, oh yeah, like, we got it. Oh, I was. I never lost confidence. Chapter five starts strong, as our communication and team synergy is better than ever. What if I like run on to the middle and then like throw you again? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh wait, I have to throw you. Oh yeah, you throw me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you want to try fire? I can set you on fire. Yeah, it's a miracle we've made it this far. And see, I would love to talk about the rest of Chapter 5, but Alex's legal team has informed me that I'm only allowed to declassify the happenings of like two levels per chapter from here on out, primarily because we started to heavily rely on an insanely diverse trick that he's covering in his video. Uh, 
So yeah, I guess I'm talking about 5-7. This level starts off with a section involving these rising platforms, which I thought would be good in a challenge where rising is the whole point, but no, apparently I'm dumb for thinking that because these things suck. They rise and fall based on cycles, but instead of being, you know, programmed normally, they're controlled by these weird mechanisms in the actual levels themselves, and they break all the time, get desynced so easily, and are insanely glitchy. But luckily, we can use all that garbage to our advantage. Alec first tosses me onto the bottom section of this moving platform, which, despite being a place where you can easily die, is for some reason considered to be safe enough ground to count as a respawn point. Whatever, fine. From there, we both have to find our way onto the top of the platform, which we can do through the ancient art of zooping. This gives us enough initial height for Alec to toss me all the way over to these guys. Now, in my current state, I got no way of getting up here, as these platforms are on a rising and falling cycle, and they don't rise for a long enough time before starting to fall right back down to square one. But I was able to get around this by doing this, I guess? What I think is happening here is that the paper airplane's collision just doesn't quite work right with these platforms. So when they run into each other while the airplane is moving up and the platform is moving down, they don't have a normal elastic collision and instead just stick to each other, offsetting both of their momentums. This allows for the platform to maintain its height in between two of its rising cycles, which effectively doubles its height. The section immediately following this one is also kind of nifty. Again, this platform down here is supposed to be determined by this laser cycle, which makes it a little too temporary to actually get any of our tricks set up. But we can again get around this, this time by having me stand on the very edge of this button such that I can activate the bridge myself without getting zapped by the laser, which allows Alec enough time to access a secret and move on. And moving on was pretty trivial, as the rest of this level easily fell to the likes of our sleuth of acrobatic maneuvers and respawn abuse, which very quickly moved us on to Chapter 5's finale. Wow, I can hear you thinking, he sure didn't talk that much about Chapter 5, this one must have been easy. Nope, you're wrong, and you know what, you're also dumb. This single finale took us four hours, and consisted of some of the most optimal routing and the most insanely precise tricks that we've seen in the challenge thus far. And this is what the winning attempt looked like. We effectively just brute force our way through this first section, with a blast and some respawn abuse before we make it to our first real obstacle. Here we have to find a way to get one of us up and into this area so we can move this rock and activate a bridge, which we do through the use of the absolute cleanest flying machine you've ever seen in your entire life. After that, and some additional throw-related maneuvers, we circle back to this area with the bridge activated. The issue though is that it's controlled by a laser cycle, which means we can't just walk across it. Instead, we briefly use it in order to take refuge in this tiny hidey hole, at which point Alec bops me onto this railing. Then and I very quickly bridge this gap when given the opportunity, something that is only occasionally possible as a result of the laser cycle being completely random. From there, I can again stand on the edge of this button in order to keep it activated for Alec in spite of the laser, allowing us to move along. Here, we line ourselves up such that this bottom guy can do a super weak blast that lands this top guy onto the button, where we can again abuse the very edge of the block in order to properly time launching ourselves through here. And all that was just so we can have one singular attempt at easily the hardest trick in the entire challenge. The game gives us jetpacks that we can't use, and a vertical shaft of just incredible proportions. Not to mention these teleporters lining both walls, which, like I previously mentioned, teleport us around at complete random if we so much as graze the wall. Clearly this is impossible. I mean, unless you do this. Obviously. And it's actually yeah, easy. What is? Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. Let me run through the steps of this trick so you can see how crazy it actually is. Alec first sets up a frog and blasts me up as soon as it reaches this exact position. This not only gets the frog pretty high up on the wall, but it's also so that when I land on the frog, the wall next to me is in between two teleporters as opposed to facing one head on, which allows me to blast against it as if it were an actual wall. Of course, my part ain't easy either. In order to get the maximum height off of a wall blast, I have to be brushed up right against it. This is an issue when you're dealing with a wall that teleports you when you touch it at all. And not only do I have to get as close as physically possible to the wall without actually touching it, but I also have to have nearly perfect timing with my blast as the frog immediately gets ready to explode as soon as I land on him, giving me extremely little room for error. But once we get past that section, the rest of the finale is pretty simple. Just kidding, the rest also sucks. After using some flame to make it past a small water section, we make it to this nonsense, a massive gap with no permanent platforms to utilize. Well, except this thing. Three, two, one, go. Oh, oh, okay, 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 uh, uh, okay, I'm just holding. first block once I get a chance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go! Oh my gosh, I almost yes! missed it up, oh my um, god. But I didn't miss, and as a result, we were able to move past Chapter 5 and straight on into Chapter 6. This place starts off with yet another incredible display of teamwork in combination with the game functioning properly with ice. Oh, Neat. guess who gamed? Welcome to my without player two <laughs> No, come on, man. <laughs> We can put that one there, and then we need to move that block up. Oh! oh. You yeah, can grab onto this one and I can blow thing. you up. Whoops. Yeah, just throw it over. Yeah. And then I'll put it in the wall, and then okay. hopefully, and never retrieve it. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't think that was part of the plan. <laughs> no, I can't get it. <laughs> Luckily though, after that fiasco, we can actually use the game's incredibly broken mechanics to our advantage in the very next level. This first section here features a bunch of blocks controlled by this button that I frankly don't know how to even do with jumping. But we don't have to worry about that in the slightest, for we can just utilize the ice up in this area to make some magic happen. So you want me to blast you? Oh, oh. and then I think I can- Kinda, kinda. I I'm through. Yes. From there, we just abused some more randomized physics to move on to the next level, which was really fun. The main obstacle of this level was this nonsense, which is an absolute mess. Although there are lava blocks here that we can bounce off of, it's straight up impossible for someone who can't jump to make it between literally any of them on their own. But since there's nothing to stand on, there's really no way for both of us to make our way through here either. So instead, we had to take a more asynchronous approach. Alec would first blast me into the first lava block, which I could then use to land on the very edge of the spike block. From there, he'd send a poison bubble underneath the platform that I could use to make it to the second lava block. And then again, this time with a force ball to get to the third lava block. And from there, I could time a force ball of my own to get the perfect angle through the final saws, bypassing this section and completing the level. This next one opens up with another 20 minute moving a rock up section before running into a pretty interesting problem. If we could get both of us down here, then we'd be able to make it past this saw easy peasy. But one of us has to be standing on this button in order to make these blocks disappear and actually grant access to that area. This is a classic paradox puzzle is what I would say if standing here didn't prevent the block from reappearing, allowing us to both go at the same time. Hey, uh, it does not think of this. And honestly, much like the regular levels of this chapter, the finale really wasn't too bad compared to the others. All it required of us was a combination of a fireball and a poison bubble at the beginning, followed by some respawn abuse, blasting off of one of our drowning bodies, skipping a boat section, and standing on each other midair in order to reduce the effects of these fans and avoid this saw. You know, comparatively simple. But unfortunately, the same cannot in any sense be said about chapter seven. A chapter that features one level, but it is by a long shot the craziest level in the entire challenge. At first, the level seems pretty standard, albeit a bit gimmicky. It's another one that's trying to be cute with its level design, as it puts the exit right at the beginning and all the gems right at the end, forcing us to travel once through the level normally and then backwards through the entire thing. This seemed perfectly fine at first, but that was only until we reached the very last section which was also the first section, but you know, backwards this time, you get it. And this section, as far as either of us know, is impossible. One of us would have to travel an inconceivable vertical distance while also horizontally moving back and forth and then back again, all while having basically nothing to stand on while doing it. Despite all of the tricks we've accumulated up until this point of the challenge, for the first time, we had no ideas. Until we did. How the, okay, so here's evil strat. One person stays at the beginning the entire time. <laughs> at first, this was a pretty stupid sounding idea. After all, although it would theoretically work with one person staying at the beginning while the other one completes the level to collect the gems, it falls apart once you realize that one person really can't do that much on their own. It's inevitable that there will be some sections here that are just not possible without the other's help, especially since this is an extremely late game level with extremely late game obstacles. It seemed like a hopeless threat until this happened. It may be completely infeasible to keep a person at the beginning for the entire level, but what if it was possible to keep a checkpoint there for the entire level? Of course, neither of us had a clue, as checkpoints at this point in the challenge have been infamously confusing, despite the fact that we've been abusing them as our primary strategy the entire time. So in order to make this strat work, I had to do what I do best, figure out the inner workings of an incredibly obscure video game mechanic in way too much detail. This is my definitive multiplayer checkpoint manifesto. So the way multiplayer checkpoints work conceptually is that they seem to follow three key rules that we've seen throughout the challenge. Rule one, when a player dies, they respawn somewhere near the other player. Rule two, a player can only spawn in an area that the game considers safe. And rule three, even if there is a safe space to respawn in, there can't be another player too close to that spot or else they'll block the respawn point. Okay, so now in order to actually define what any of these things really mean though, we're gonna have to pull back the layers a bit. So this second idea of safe spaces is achieved super simply. There's just invisible checkpoints. However, unlike single player checkpoints, these these guys are everywhere, and their seemingly random placements indicate that they weren't manually placed throughout the levels, but rather determined by a poor, overworked, and probably underpaid algorithm. Either that, or the checkpoints actually look like this, with the exact position of the respawn location being determined by where you first land, but that's just a highly plausible but more confusing way of looking at it, so let's not think about that. But anyway, these invisible multiplayer checkpoints also deviate from the regular single player ones in another key way, and that's the fact that triggering them doesn't actually set a checkpoint for you. Instead, in order to achieve the effect of the first rule, triggering a checkpoint 
only defines it as a respawn point for the other guy. This means that at all times, there are actually two active checkpoints, one for each player, and they're only updated when the other guy triggers a new one for you. This idea conceptually works for most situations, and it does make intuitive sense, at least to me. In fact, it actually explains this moment pretty concisely. I set up Alex's checkpoint up here while he set up mine on the bottom. So if I throw him and die, then it doesn't work. But if he throws me and dies, then it works perfectly. However, this system doesn't quite take the third rule into consideration. See, if each player only has one stored checkpoint, then what happens when a player dies while the other guy is standing on his respawn? According to rule 3, he can't spawn there because this guy's sitting on it. But according to our current hypothesis, this means that he's got nowhere to go. Of course, this doesn't break the game or anything in practice, and instead, he just respawns in a different spot. Uh-oh, you might know what that means. Each player doesn't just have one stored checkpoint, they each have a queue of two. Rather than just flat out replacing your current respawn point when the other guy triggers a new checkpoint, the game instead seems to just advance the queue, putting your old checkpoint in the second position while placing the new one up front. This means that in most cases, dying will just respawn you at whatever checkpoint is stored in your first position, the primary one. But in the case that the checkpoint is being blocked by the other guy, the game will instead refer back to the checkpoint in the second position, the secondary one. And it's this precise detail that might just allow us to keep the very beginning of the level as a checkpoint for the entire way through. Let's get down to business. When we start the level, both of us have the beginning cage as our only stored checkpoint. We then both make our way down to this area, which is the first spot thus far into the level that is considered safe, meaning we both save a new checkpoint for the other player. Alex then bops me up into this teleporter, which warps me into another safe space, which saves yet another new checkpoint for him. Now it's at this point where we gotta be real careful, for although we have made progress in the level, the beginning only currently exists as my secondary checkpoint, which just isn't gonna fly. Ideally, we wanna get Alec physically back at the beginning so he can set it as my primary checkpoint without losing our forward progress. The way we can do this is by first moving Alec on top of my current primary checkpoint and having me die. This respawns me at the beginning, my secondary checkpoint, which then sets it as Alec's new primary checkpoint. Then, if I continue standing on it as he dies, then he spawns on the cloud that I was just standing on, which gives me the forward progress in the form of a new checkpoint. And finally, we can swap our positions by simply dying at the same time, which puts me at the later point of the level, while Alex stays at the beginning. The level has officially begun. Now you might be thinking that we'll need to continue this nonsense through the entire rest of the level, but that's thankfully not quite the case. If I can somehow make some good headway on my own, then although it'll certainly shuffle Alex checkpoints all out of whack, mine won't change at all, and I'll be able to keep the beginning of the level stored as my primary checkpoint indefinitely, with the cloud as my secondary checkpoint for whenever I die. All that is just to say that it's schmoobin' time. Alright, that was pretty cool. Yeah, there's actually quite a lot more you can do with just one person than you may have expected. You wanna know what you can't do though? Climb normal freaking walls. Seriously, how is this the insurmountable obstacle in this level? It's unbelievable. But it's not too bad, for since the beginning is still technically my primary checkpoint, Alec can die and teleport to my most recently updated respawn without completely phasing it out of my queue. From here, he can help me get over this wall using a way overcomplicated setup that I forgot why we even did. But in doing this, I set a new checkpoint for Alec on top of the wall. At this point then, Alec stands on my primary checkpoint as I die, respawning me back at the beginning, and I stay at the beginning as Alec dies so he can respawn past the wall, with the beginning stored as his primary. It was the home stretch. Alec uses some standard blasting maneuvers to unlock the gem vault, but we still have one more obstacle to conquer, actually collecting the gems. Boomerangs, which I haven't really mentioned until now, are actually able to collect gems from afar, but he couldn't seem to find a possible angle that could collect these up here. But since we had a solid understanding of checkpoints at this point, we could die in a specific order to tag me into the ring. And this is what I came up with. I figured so much out though, this has to be it. There is that block. Oh, that's it, that's there. it, look at that. Whoa, whoa. You see that, you see that ring? That. You see that ring? I, that ring? <laughs> Yeah, and then we just did the same dang thing for the finale. And finally, with all that, we've reached chapter eight, the final world in the entire game without yet even having to think about jumping. And although we've conquered every single previous chapter by learning a bunch of new tricks, all we had to do for these final levels was apply everything that we've already learned.
So, is it possible to beat Battle Block Theater without jumping? Well, yeah. Or at least, half of it is. That's right, you've reached the end of the video, but this is nowhere near the end of the challenge. If you like this video, then you should definitely check out Alex F. It should be on screen right now and in the description. There are so many insanely cool things that we did in this run that I didn't feature in this video, so you'd be missing out if you didn't watch it. And also, a quick reminder, if you want to try out gamer subs, it's literally free. You don't even need to put any card information, it's just a shipping address. And hey, maybe you just want a funny sample sticker, that's fine too. But yeah, anyway, thanks for watching, do some of the YouTube things, subscribe to the second channel, I'm out of here.